So thank you for joining us for our first um, In the Black speaker event in conjunction with the Northern section of the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association. Uh, the events today start off our conversation on exploring racial and social um, inequalities in business. I'll introduce myself. My name is Dr. Solar Lufrano Jardine. I will be your moderator for today. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Kenneth Evans for being with us here today. Um, he is the president of the Urban Chamber of Commerce of Las Vegas, and we'll be able to learn more about creating those equitable, equitable communities from him. Um, we'll start with a general overview of some of the various issues that African Americans face in regard to starting and operating a business, and then what the Urban Chamber of Commerce of Las Vegas is doing to support African American business owners in Nevada. Um, we'll end with a call to action and what we can do as individual communities to foster um, business development and entrepreneurship to these diverse groups. Uh, after the presentation, we'll open um, up the group for questions. You'll be able to ask them to Mr. Evans directly, um, but if you would like me to ask the question, you can certainly add it to the chat box and I'll take note of it and ask it um, when the time comes. So we do ask that everyone please stay muted um, until you're ready to ask a question. And a reminder that today's educational luncheon is worth a total of one AICP CM credits for AICP members. Um, and then we're also recording uh, this session and that will be available on the chapter's YouTube channel. Uh, so let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Kenneth Evans. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much, Starla. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to you about creating equitable communities and how that ties to business and doing our part in the business community to make sure that as we see at the Urban Chamber of Commerce, we build businesses to build our communities. Uh, what I'd like to do is take you through a presentation and a conversation that we've been having in the Southern Nevada region around creating equitable communities. And one of the things we try to get across is the fact that there's a tie between economic justice and social justice. And that since we are in a capitalistic society, to the extent we can do what we can to address and hopefully minimize some of the historical wealth disparities, home ownership disparities, and in this case, the small business ownership disparities, this will help us overall as a society to create an equitable uh, community and equitable communities across the country. Uh, what I'm going to do is share a presentation, I'm gonna hit some of the summary points, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about some of the things that the Urban Chamber is doing, and then we can move into a question and answer period. Uh, what I'll share with you is I definitely want this to be uh, interactive and instructive towards the end so that we move forward with a call to action such that when it's all said and done, we create equitable communities by addressing some of the economic uh, things that need to happen. Let me state this. Uh, for those of you that uh, follow Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, one of the things I hope you recognize is that when he was unfortunately assassinated in 1968, he was right on the cusp of introducing economic justice and stressing the fact that while we appreciate as African Americans getting our civil rights, at the end of the day, because it's a capitalistic society, we needed to focus on our economic or our silver rights in order to really be successful in this country. Uh, so to that end, uh, that's something that we pay attention to uh, at the Urban Chamber of Commerce and just in general uh, as individuals within communities of color. And that's the fact that we need to, again, address some of the disparities that exist in terms of wealth, home ownership, and ultimately business ownership too, so that we can come to terms with some of the things that are happening and preventing us from having a bit more equitable community. Uh, so let me do this. I'll start out 
I'll go ahead and share my uh, presentation here. And what this, uh, what's going on in Southern Nevada is we have a, a coalition or a collaboration occurring between the Urban Chamber, the Vegas Chamber, and the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. Uh, in the uh, Northern Nevada region, uh, I believe it's called uh, EDON, which I think it stands for uh, Economic Development Alliance of Western Nevada or EDON. Uh, so that's the Northern Nevada equivalent of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, which is our regional development authority. And, and again, the idea behind creating equitable communities is we wanted to have a conversation that connects social justice to economic development, but not just have a conversation. What's just as important is to make sure that once we think we've identified the root causes versus the symptoms, and we have a plan of attack, let's move forward collectively as a business community to ensure that all segments of our population are participating in our community, as well as we're addressing some of the social concerns. So that was the idea behind creating equitable communities here in the Southern Nevada region. But from my standpoint, uh, having traveled the United States, uh, as well as a little bit overseas, I would suggest that the, the formula we're using could apply to most any uh, place in the United States where equity is considered to be an issue. And again, I'm the uh, president of the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Uh, very quick little bit about my background. I've been at the Urban Chamber for seven plus years now, but I've been in the state of Nevada for 30 years now uh, since coming here on active duty Air Force. I was a civil engineer and in particular a military engineer. Uh, I've also uh, deployed, but at the same time, I've always had an interest in being an entrepreneur. So I've owned a, a couple of small businesses myself. And then, as I mentioned, uh, came to the Urban Chamber about seven plus years ago in an effort to help them continue to grow the chamber to address some of the equity, economic, social justice, issues that were prevalent, but again, doing it from an economic standpoint. So let's talk about the uh, Kerner Commission Report. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, the Kerner Commission Report was a report that was sanctioned by then President Lyndon Johnson, and it was because they were having quite a bit of civil unrest in, in the summer of 1967. In, in fact, uh, uh, New Jersey, uh, was, a, was a big epicenter for some of what was going on. And the idea was let's pull together a commission that can look at these civil disturbances and hopefully get to the root causes of why they're happening and move forward. So it was 11 member uh, presidential commission established by uh, President Johnson under executive order and again, what he wanted to do is let's look at the root causes for these riots, if you will, and then come up with some recommendations to move forward. And what I will share with you is the reason why I always mention the Kerner Commission Report is because in my own studies and research, uh, call it the engineer in me, one thing I notice is that in America, we continue to go through these 20 to 30 year cycles where something happens, uh, whether this summer it was George Floyd, uh, being uh, killed, but something happens and it acts as a stimulus. There's civil unrest, there's civil disturbance, uh, at a minimum, there are protests. But it's kind of like we wash, rinse, and repeat because we never really get to the root causes and take action on them. And that's something that we want to prevent or address. So that's the reason why I take people back to the Kerner Commission report. Uh, it's something that was introduced to me by my mentor, uh, believe it or not, uh, back in the uh, 90s when we were dealing with the Rodney King uh, unrest. He said, here, take a look at the Kerner Commission report. And sure enough, what I discovered is this is something that's happening cyclical. And I'll just say as a leader myself, let alone someone that's involved in the business community, I would really like us 
to address the root causes and then move forward, even when it's uncomfortable. And anything, anyone that knows anything about growth will appreciate that in order to grow, you have to be willing to be comfortable being uncomfortable in order to bring about that growth. So the Kerner Commission Report is a good starting place. Uh, there were three questions that uh, President Johnson asked them to look at. Number one, what happened? Number two, why did it happen? And number three, what can be done to prevent it from happening again? So that was the purpose and the focus of this commission was to take those three questions, examine them, talk to a wide range of stakeholders, and then develop some recommendations to move forward with. Here's what they came up with uh, seven months uh, after their investigation and then the report. Uh, they said, essentially there are five things we need to focus on uh, from a root cause standpoint, recommendations for planned uh, action standpoint. Number one, lack of economic opportunity. Uh, the bottom line is we are in a capitalistic society, but if everyone doesn't feel like that they can participate and beyond that, if they can't participate as small, diverse businesses, this is gonna to contribute to unrest. Uh, something that I would share with you, which is the reason why it's so important to us here at the Urban Chamber to have small, diverse businesses, is the bottom line in America, but beyond that in Nevada, the lion's share of jobs are created by small businesses. So that's something to keep in mind is if we're concerned about everybody being able to participate economically, we need to make sure that people have the ability to start businesses, especially small businesses, which will turn around and create jobs. So the first thing was lack of economic opportunity. Uh, next was failed social service programs. And I'm not gonna stay on that one too long because I think the, the purpose of today is to focus on economics. But what I would like to say is this, to the extent that we can create viable small businesses that hire people, put resources into the community, and then participate in political advocacy, we at the Urban Chamber feel like that will reduce the need or the requirement for social services. I'm not going to say it's going to totally eliminate it, but again, the idea is to the extent that people participate fully to their potential in the economic environment, it decreases the need for social services. Uh, next up, uh, police brutality. Uh, again, I won't stay on this one too long, uh, but what I would suggest is that uh, criminal justice reform is something that we as business people could and should pay attention to because it impacts the public safety that our businesses uh, will need in order to be viable. And I don't have to touch too much on that. I think we've seen some of the things that have happened across the country. And on the one hand, uh, complaints can be made about some of the counterproductive behavior that occurs as a result of anger and emotion. Uh, but again, what I would suggest is to the extent that we address the economic inequalities and inequities, uh, perhaps that'll be a prevention for some of the uh, counterproductive behavior that we see. Uh, next, uh, it, it suggested that racism. Uh, one of the things that we talked about with creating equitable communities is our goal is to go from systemic racism to systemic opportunities. And note that I put the word systemic in front of both racism and opportunities. Uh, the point I'm making and getting at there is that if Things historically happened a certain way due to systemic racism, whether it was redlining in the housing market, whether it was uh, redlining or preventing businesses from getting the capital they needed then, and it's still a challenge now. But if these things happen systemically to keep African Americans from fully participating in a capitalistic system, then what we should consider is there are some systemic things we may need to do either temporarily or over a long protracted period of time to counteract what happened and what was done before. But it is definitely an issue. Uh, I will tell you, it gives me pause as someone 
uh, that has uh, been alive for now 57 years now, it gives me pause that there are individuals that are unwilling or unable to acknowledge that our country still has systemic racism as an element that we have to deal with. And I will tell you, it still in some cases creates challenges and impediments within the business community. Don't get me wrong, things are better since the 1960s, uh, but to the extent that you have individuals that may have been teenagers or young adults in the 1960s, and now they're in prevalent positions as elected officials, as business people in the military, like the environment that I was in, perhaps they're gonna carry some of their biases and prejudices that will create systemic racism. And so we need to address that so that we can create systemic opportunities. Finally, the media played a role and it was suggested that the media was playing a role in what was going on as well. Won't harp on that either, uh, but again, I'll just say that maybe the best thing to do there is just to make sure that all views and perspectives are brought to bear within the media. And the best way to do that is to make sure that the media staff, writers, uh, production people, the people in front of the camera, if you're talking about TV, just make sure there's some diversity there so that all views and perspectives are presented. But these were the five things that the Kerner Commission report suggested were causing the issues. So to the extent that we address those things, we make progress. To the extent that we don't address them, as the Eisenhower Foundation report updates came out with, to the extent we address things, things improve, they get better. But at the same time, if you read the Kerner Commission Report, I'll just tell you anecdotally, I've had more than a few people read the Kerner Commission Report and come back to me and say, Ken, wow, in this case, not much has changed. So think about that for a minute. If they independently can read this report and come back with the conclusion that, wow, not much has changed, well, then it only stands to reason, maybe that's why we're experiencing some of the cyclical unrest and disturbances and systemic inequities and inequalities that we see in America. Uh, but again, the Eisenhower Foundation, every 10 years they update and they just provide some insight into what's been done and what still needs to be done. And I'll just tell you overall, there's still work to be done. So how does this relate to us? And, and what can we do with this? Because keep in mind, the Kerner Commission report was investigated in 1967, and the report came out uh, in mid-year 1968, a little over 50 years ago. Here's what I propose that we do. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all the questions verbatim, but I think what I can do is I can provide this presentation via PDF because Here's what I would like to suggest. You can take the three questions where they talked about what happened, why did it happen, and what can we do to prevent it from happening again, and you can use those core, those three core questions to come up with the six questions that we did here. And very quickly, in summary, number one talked about what are the economic conditions and disparities that African Americans were facing prior to COVID-19 that are now being exacerbated by COVID-19. Because there were definitely disparities that existed prior to COVID-19. And I can tell you firsthand from talking to some of our small diverse business owners, it's just been exacerbated. Uh, number two, what are we doing in Nevada to diversify and expand our economy? And the reason why I ask this question is because we need to look at pre-COVID-19, but definitely it's been amplified by COVID-19. What do we need to do to expand and diversify our economy so that we'll have a more resilient community, tax base, and ability to make our way through the economic peaks and valleys? But it's not just about asking, what can we do and expand and diversify our economy? We need to make sure everybody can participate in that. Which leads to question number three. How do we make sure that African-Americans can participate on the front end? 
as well as individuals from other communities of color, how do we make sure that they can participate in the policy discussions, the planning that goes on, the strategic planning that goes on so that no one is lost or left behind? And then once we've done that, the fourth question looks at employment, specifically employment opportunities in emerging markets. Uh, if we look at Southern Nevada, but I think it holds true for all of Nevada, right now, information technology, artificial intelligence, renewable energy, that will be a big deal. For example, we just passed question number six, which will ensure that we have a renewable energy goal of at least 50% original source will be renewable energy. Well, how do we make sure that African Americans and other communities of color participate in that? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. From an employment standpoint, number five gets into, from a procurement standpoint, specifically for small diverse businesses, how do we make sure that they participate in the expansion and the diversification of our Nevada-based economy? We wanted to ask that question and be deliberate and intentional with the answers in terms of taking action on it. And then finally, what can we do to get people to understand that there's a link between some of the social challenges we face and economic justice or inequities that exist? Again, I go back to the point I made about the goal being go from systemic racism to systemic opportunities, which says that every single individual has the ability to reach and fulfill their highest potential. Uh, I'll just share this with you. Uh, I'm an Air Force Academy graduate, uh, so by all means, I've been afforded some of the greatest opportunities that this country has to offer. Um, had a 25 plus year career as an engineer, uh, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, retired as a Lieutenant Colonel, had a great experience within this country. Uh, leveraged a lot of those experiences and some of the assets to start not one but two businesses but I still had a few challenges along the way. But all in all, it's been a pretty good journey with me, despite the fact that from a social economic standpoint, I grew up in LA, my mother raised three boys, I have a twin brother and a younger brother, four years younger, and my father was never in the picture. So yes, face some of those historical social economic challenges that would hamper one's ability to reach their full potential in this country, but was able to do it because my mother stressed excellence and education. And fortunately, I was able to take a path and a journey that enabled me to take full advantage of those things. Well, from my standpoint, we need to make sure that we have an environment and we create an environment where as opposed to putting artificial barriers or allowing historical barriers to get in the way of people's ability to achieve, instead what they can do is they can realize systemic opportunities much like I did. And that's the goal. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just quickly mention that COVID-19 again showed the fact that disproportionately the inequities that were already present are just got ex exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, for example, here you'll see that overall active small businesses fell by 22%, but then when you look at the African American and then the Latinx small businesses, they fell by 41 and 32% respectively. And then in contrast, the majority population only fell by 17%. So we need to look at what caused these things, what, what caused the disparity and what can we do about it from a business standpoint? And then this slide here just talks about the fact, I already touched on the fact that there's a disparity in terms of wealth. There's a wealth gap, which is uh, impacted by home ownership and beyond that business ownership. And, and as what this slide points out is that unfortunately the gap widened decreased a little bit, but it's creeping back up again. We need to ask ourselves why and do something about it. Uh, household incomes uh, for Clark County, 
Uh, there's about a twenty twenty five thousand dollars. What this is saying is that even when there is uh, home ownership, if you will, or, or household income, there's still a disparity here between the incomes of about twenty twenty five thousand. Uh, unemployment rates uh, by race and ethnicity. What this slide suggests is that uh, prior to COVID-19, the country was coming back economically, but there was still a disparity there. But now with COVID-19, things have opened back up again. And this touches on the home ownership. So where are we now? Uh, here at the Urban Chamber of Commerce, uh, what we focus on is making sure that we provide a platform for small diverse businesses to consider getting launched, launch, or even to grow and go to the next level. Uh, we're, we're fortunate and we're blessed in that uh, we have a business incubator, uh, plus we have a business resource center, and we pull those two things together to make up the Urban Chamber Business Success Centers. Uh, we have resource partners like SCORE, uh, Nevada Small Business Development Center or NSBDC. Uh, we have both traditional lenders, plus we have alternative lenders like um, the Nevada Business Opportunity Fund, uh, Dream Spring, which is formerly Oxion. And then in addition to that, one of the things we've identified and I've personally experienced is I've been an equity investor with just a few zeros behind my name, but enough to learn and appreciate that in addition to the lender base options for getting access to capital, we also need to make available the equity based options where in exchange for ownership, a nominal amount of ownership or uh, a stock interest, our business owners can get access to capital. But one of the things we run into is that if you've never been exposed to trying to get equity capital or what an angel investor is or venture capital is, capitalist is, if you haven't been exposed to that, you won't know to ask. So part of what we do at the Urban Chambers, we're creating our own equity investor network, plus we're interacting with some of the other equity investor groups and networks so that we can better take care of our businesses. We also make it a point to provide training uh, for entrepreneurs that are just getting started. Uh, we have a great relationship with the US Small Business Administration. Uh, I wanna say thank you very much uh, to Joe Amato in absentia. Uh, he was already a great partner prior to COVID-19 happening, has been even uh, a better partner in terms of making sure that our small diverse businesses got access to the uh, Paycheck Protection Program or PPP funds, as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or IDLE funds as well. Uh, the point I wanna make is that COVID-19, again, exacerbated some of the disparities that already existed between some of our small businesses and other businesses that may exist in other communities. And so what we want to do as we move forward is two key things. We, we have a partnership with the Governor's Office of Economic Development and what that's primarily focused on is making sure that the Urban Chamber participates in the diversification and the expansion of our economy. And, and that has two areas of focus. Obviously, number one, we focus on the domestic economic activity that happens within the state of Nevada. But then number two, just as importantly, given the fact that 95% of the markets are outside the boundaries or the borders of the United States, we also a few years ago decided to go global. Uh, when you look at the advantages of operating virtually and e-commerce, that gives you the ability, even as a small business, to get connected to the global economy. So it's more than just a trite phrase. So again, our first focus is to make sure that we participate as a chamber in the expansion and the diversification of the Nevada economy. But then just as important, number two, we want to make sure that this effort is done in an inclusive manner. So that means making sure that we are at the table, as we like to say, so we won't be on the menu. That means we want to be involved on the front end with the policy discussions, the strategic planning, all of the things that go into figuring out the pathway forward for the Nevada economy. And then number two, we also want to make sure that by doing those front end things that we're already at the table and that we're in a position 
to make sure that our small diverse businesses are getting the procurement opportunities they need, as well as the education, the training, and the access to the workforce development system to grow their businesses and get the team they need to be successful. It's our hope that this is our part that we can do to create equitable communities. Uh, what I'll conclude by saying uh, before we open up for uh, questions is, uh, I told you I started at the chamber seven plus years ago. Uh, when I did, I pulled two of my colleagues that I had known for a while and I said, I, I wanna get a letter out so I communicate what the focus will be over the time and my tenure as president at the chamber. And so we crafted a letter and what I stressed as the leader of the organization, but believe me, we've done it as a team, is that we were here to focus on the economic side, quote unquote, of the term social economic. The bottom line is to go back to where Dr. King was in 1968 and bring it forward. Make sure that the story he told doesn't remain true, where he said, what good is it to have the civil rights to go inside the restaurant, sit at the counter, if you don't have the economic wherewithal or the silver rights in order to purchase, this, purchase the hamburger? So what I would suggest to all of you is that the pathway forward is to make sure that we stay focused on the economic side of the term socioeconomic so that we build businesses that can build our community and do it in an equitable, inclusive manner. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much. That was fantastic, absolutely. Um, so now we'll go ahead and open up for questions. I have one in the chat that I will read off from Chad. Um, it starts off with, are there certain types of small businesses that the African-American community tends to engage in or gravitate towards? Yes, um, from, from my, my past experience, experience here, I'm not only seven, seven years, years that I've been in a chamber, chamber. but even beyond, beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not like, like, I'm gonna answer that question, question generically, I'll give a specific, specific example. example. Uh, one, uh, one of the, one of the things, things I've noticed in seeing a change in the is that, that uh, our, our Let's see here. Oh. Ken, can you unmute yourself real quick? We had, we seem to have some. There we go. Yeah. Go ahead and try that. That's 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 that. Our, our community tends to operate in, in two areas. areas. Uh, one one generic, and I'll give a specific example. Generically. Ken, can you hear me? Give yes, us yes. just a second. Your audio is coming out with your whole answer there. I don't know if maybe you stop your video, it might connect your audio better. Or if we, yep, take off a PowerPoint, that might work too. Go ahead and try again. Let's see if that fixes it. Okay, okay how's this now? now? Shoot. Okay. Now, hmm. Let's see what's going on here. Give him just a second. And you guys can keep putting your um, questions in the chat or you can save them for him to be able to answer directly when you're ready to ask. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, while he is out though, I would like to make a quick little shout out. Um, I was gonna do this at the end, but since we have a minute, um, I advise the Black Business Student Association with the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, I have two of my club members here, Michael and Serene. Um, so when we talk about um, kind of creating these communities and being able to bridge everyone together and you know what can we do to help these groups um, coming and being part of our Black Business Associate Student Association is really important um, because we want to make sure that we give these students the exact same opportunities that other students may have too and oftentimes these students need a little extra support mentorship um, we're really looking for ways that they can navigate the business world and by having people out in the community and professionals that are able to do that 
be part of the club and support these students through their college education um, is incredibly important. So I um, just wanted to give a little shout out to my Black Business Student Association um, club members that are here today uh, because again, we're building bridges to move things forward and this is certainly a group that's starting to do that. So perfect. Thank you for that. All right, Ken, how you doing? Uh, hopefully you can All hear me right. better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Okay, so we had our question. Let me just reiterate that real quick. It was just making sure, um, are there certain types of small businesses that the African American community tends to engage in or gravitate towards? Uh, okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to answer generically and then I'll give a specific uh, example. From a generic standpoint, what I've observed uh, during the time that I've been at the chamber and even before is that a lot of our African-American businesses are in what I would call the service-based uh, types of businesses, meaning it could be professional services like an architect, an engineer, uh, an attorney, uh, basic insurance. Bottom line is things where there's not necessarily a tangible uh, product or, or something along those lines that you're selling, but a lot of our businesses or in that service-based space. Uh, in many cases, professional, administrative, but not necessarily technical. Although I will say we have a information technology or an IT roundtable, which is seeking to change that. Uh, we actually have some individuals that are on the cutting edge within the IT space in terms of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. Uh, why is that important? Uh, it's important because as we seek to expand and diversify our economy, to the extent you are in a industry or a market or a sector where it's a bit more of a niche market or specialized, what that does is that cuts down on your competition uh, in, lay, in layperson's term. Uh, there's a business term that talks about barrier to entry, and what that means is the higher the barrier to entry, the lower the amount potentially of competition. On the other hand, if you're operating in fields that are typically a bit more service-based with uh, a low or lower barrier to entry, there's gonna be a lot more competition. And if traditionally you've not necessarily been in that space before, and there are a lot of other people in there that are already pretty well established, it's gonna be harder to crack into that industry. Let me give you a specific example. Uh, not that all African Americans can cook or cook well, because you definitely don't want to come to my restaurant if I'm the one cooking, but uh, we do have quite a few African Americans that pursue uh, business opportunities within the restaurant industry. I'm not knocking that, but what I would say is just from a purely business standpoint, Part of the challenge there is that anyone that knows anything about restaurants knows that they have a high failure rate, and even when they are successful, they're extremely labor intensive, and the, mar the margins, meaning the profit margins, are low. So part of the message I would put out there is, and this is the reason why I talked about us asking the question, how's the state going to expand and diversify its economy, is we want to make sure that our small, diverse businesses pay attention to those trends, and more importantly, help set those trends. So that's the reason why I applaud what some of the members of our IT roundtable are doing, is because they are cutting edge, coming up with applications, programming, as well as products that can be sold and marketed within the IT arena. And this is a good thing. Uh, in a perfect world, we need African-American businesses that represent in all components of our economy, be it renewable energy, healthcare, construction, IT, whatever it is, we need to make sure that we are just as diversified because then that will lead to better and improved economic resiliency within the African-American community. Excellent point. And I think that that bringing back to those professional services is really important um, because there's a renewed interest in being able to follow, 
who you're working with and you know what the chain is of how you purchase something to make sure that it's ethical and just along the way and so when you have those professional services owned by you know an african american person you you know directly who you're supporting and people want to see who they're supporting um, so it's nice to have that um, you know almost immediate verification of this is a person this is a company this is a, a widget that i want to be able to get behind um, so definitely a good point there i have from margo um, what is the chamber's first measurable goal coming out of the pandemic and with the new federal administration I would say our first measurable goal is we have a hashtag here, survive to thrive. So our first measurable goal is to see how many of our businesses survive slash are surviving the initial pandemic response, as well as the initial stages of recovery. That's number one. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is literally, we've been going through our membership roster uh, periodically making calls, just not to ask them for membership dues, but to ask them, how are you doing? Uh, are you still around? Are you still in business? Uh, in addition to that, we've been doing webinars to make sure that people get information about PPP, IDLE, if they need help uh, filling out the forms, or in some cases, one of the other things we do as a chamber is we advocate on behalf of our businesses. So part of our advocacy efforts have involved getting people to understand that just because they receive PPP funds, they still need to get some of these other follow on CARES Act funding mechanisms to use for their small business because they may have experienced revenue losses of 50, 75, or nearly 100%. So they need to be able to layer the assistance. So our ability to talk to our federal delegation to our state legislators, as well as to state public appointed officials and let them know when you implement these small business relief efforts, please do it in this manner. Those are the types of things that we could and should do, which will lead to improved metrics as far as, again, how many of our businesses make it through or are making it through right now. In terms of the recovery, I think our metric will be how many of our businesses participate in the new and emerging sectors that are, will help to diversify the Nevada economy. So what I'll be interested and will be interested to see is how many of our businesses are in the IT arena or how many of our businesses do something in healthcare to include mental health care space to help further bolster our health care system in the state of Nevada. It's no secret that we're challenged in that area. So what better way to be successful as a business owner while still doing good by providing value within the healthcare environment? So I would suggest those are the two metrics that we are looking at and will continue to look at as we move forward. Excellent. And you had talked in your presentation about um, you know, that social service opportunity. And so when we think about the strain that COVID has put on businesses, it has caused a lot of businesses to retract what they could do possibly socially, you know, maybe programs that they had, um, ways they supported their employees or the community. And so as, you know, business owners, you know, build out their business, it's also good to think about that social component so that we're deliberate with our actions, with our dollars, um, with how we help our community. Because even if a small business owner is, you know, has a service over here, they still could, you know, help K through 12 education or mental right. health, as you said. So there's opportunities for us to support those business owners in the hopes that they then can go out and maybe do something on the social realm, you know, through their, their business endeavors too. So absolutely. Uh, let me talk about it in terms of direct versus indirect. The direct benefit is to the extent our small businesses stay in business and then hopefully some of them eventually grow, they keep people employed and therefore they don't tax an already 
overburdened unemployment system. So I'll just say it just that bluntly and just that basic. A major reason why we all should figure out a way to support small diverse businesses is because they can impact employment in a positive way. Now from an indirect standpoint, but just as important is, a lot of times the small businesses are your neighbor or they go to church with you. So because of that, they build the types of relationships that if you need a sponsor for a sports team, or if you need somebody to donate a prize for a raffle to raise money for your church or community-based organization, you leverage those kind of relationships to get that kind of support. So again, to the extent we keep these small diverse businesses going, and in particular, African-American owned business owners going, we're doing a great job of ensuring that we cut down on black unemployment. And in addition to that, we keep them in a position to provide some of those sponsorships and other things that will keep our community whole. Fantastic. Absolutely. One, very well said. Thank you. All right. And um, two other questions. We should be able to get to them pretty good. I have Carlo, what specific actions can existing Nevada businesses take to be allies to the Urban Chamber? I know we want to um, definitely end today with a good call to action. Um, and then in the other one, which we can also get to, which is identifying um, the emergency, em, excuse me, emerging se uh, sectors. So we'll kick off with some calls to action that we can do for existing businesses. Okay, perfect. Uh, here's what I'll suggest. Uh, what we appreciate is obviously uh, we're a membership based or, or driven organization, but we do a lot of programming and events to help small businesses get started, vet their ideas, or if they're already in business, grow. So what I would suggest is to the extent you support our small businesses, whether it's the service they provide or in the cases where they do have a product, to the extent you support our small businesses, you support us as a chamber. And then for those of you that are interested in coming on board as a member, we welcome that as well. What I would also uh, suggest to you is that if you are part of a larger public agency or a private corporation, create procurement opportunities and be willing to uh, take a chance, a calculated risk. You know, I tell people all the time, uh, I'm a risk taker. I just take calculated risks. So what I mean by that is still do your due diligence and you may come to find out that maybe there's some mentoring you need to do from a procurement standpoint, but still create those kind of procurement opportunities. Because to the extent you do that, you're helping a small diverse business, or in this case, you're helping an African-American owned business turn around and do three things. Create jobs, put their resources back into the community that they represent or they come from, and then finally participate in the political process in some capacity. So my call to action would be, in some cases, get outside your comfort zone. You know, I talked earlier about the fact that in order to grow, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, which means you, have, you may have to do some things or address some things or establish some relationships that take you out of your historical comfort zone. Let me go back to what I said previously. If you look at the history of our countries, if you look at the history of our country, even the modern history, meaning since the 1960s forward, systemic racism exists. You, you know, I'll debate anyone, I don't care who it is, it does exist. Now that doesn't mean it has to be a permanent impediment, but it, it does exist. And we all have personal biases and prejudices. For example, uh, my two roommates at the Air Force Academy, one of my roommates had never interacted with African Americans before, except what he saw on TV. Now, ironically, he was from the Cleveland area. So his favorite football player was Jim Brown. But the point I'm making is he had never personally interacted with African Americans prior to us showing up as fourth classmen or freshmen at the Air Force Academy. However, comma, I'm from the inner city, so I'd had limited interaction 
uh, with uh, Caucasians or definitely individuals from the Midwest or maybe a little more rural environments. But we worked it out, we figured it out because we were both willing to work through some of the prejudices, some of the biases we had, and that can be uncomfortable. So that's the point I'm making right now is in order to support businesses, sometimes you may have to take a chance at going to a business that you weren't familiar with before. Or let me give you this example. When I was in the Air Force Reserve, I used to go to Southern California. One of the things I did is with my other uh, officer colleagues, and primarily they were Caucasian, we'd pick a place to go eat lunch. Well, every now and then what I would subtly but intentionally do is there was a place called Louisiana Seafood in Southern California in the Riverside area. What I would do is I'd say, hey, let's try a different place. Now, I could tell by their nonverbals and things that they didn't know the place. And, you know, we're all creatures of habit. But that was my subtle but intentional way of introducing them to a di another small, diverse, or in this case, African-American-owned business. So I would suggest the call to action is to the extent that you can do those types of things intentionally and, it, and if you're, for example, not African-American and you get that kind of an invitation, accept it and try it out because it'll go a long way to addressing some of what we're talking about today. Very good. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And I think with, with COVID, we've all been thrown out of our comfort zones. Um, so what a great time to continue to push forward, try new things, do things differently, just because it's how we've done it in the past or you've worked it out with your family or whatever it may be does not mean it always has to be that way. And right. so what a great opportunity to say, well, you know, let me start giving back to, you know, groups of people that really need this extra help that, you know, really have a staple in my community. Um, you know, I see slogans and signs up that say, you know, shop at your small business today so that yeah. you can visit them tomorrow. And that's because, you know, we have to put in the effort today to make sure that they're around longer. So when we want to go back, they're still there. Um, I hate saying, geez, I wish I went there more often because now they're out of business and that's the last thing we want. So, you know, this is a great time to be able to push forward and, and change and do something completely different. Um, so we are a couple of minutes over. I'll ask if there are any final questions um, that we could answer quickly before we close out our event. Anything? Okay. You guys have been a fantastic audience. I would like to thank um, Mr. Oh. Evans for being here today. Um, I will say that, um, you know, this is a great opportunity to learn more about how we create those equitable communities, how we lift our African American members. Um, again, if you have a chance to connect with groups, um, the Urban Chamber of Commerce, you know, please do so that, again, we can work together to keep these groups around that do um, this vital work in our community. Um, you can reach out to myself uh, if you're interested in the Black Business Student Association, um, if you'd like to learn more. The presentation today will be shared with the attendees um, as a reference as well. And our next In the Black event will be November 24th at noon, and we will send out more details um, as we get closer. So I think we're good to go. Yeah, I, I just like to say uh, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. And to the individual that asked the question about emerging sectors, just a couple of quick ones, uh, healthcare, renewable energy, artificial intelligence, uh, cybersecurity. But if you go to the governor's office the economic development website, uh, there's information there about the direction the state's going as far as our economy. But Thank you all again. Thanks for having an open mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for attending. We appreciate your support today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next In the Black event on November 24th. Thank you.